Mr. Brandis accepts it, Stephen said, as the first play of the closing period. Does he? What does Mr. Sidney Lee, or Mr. Simon Lazarus, as some of his name is, say of it? Marina, Stephen said, a child of storm. Miranda, a wonder. Perdita, that which was lost. What was lost is given back to him, his daughter's child. My dearest wife, Pericles says, was like this maid. Will any man love the daughter if he has not loved the mother? The art of being a grandfather, Mr. Best can murmur. L'art d'être grand. Will he not see reborn in her, with the memory of his own youth added, another image? Do you know what you are talking about? Love, yes. Word known to all men. Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today, on this very special day, we are looking at James Joyce's Ulysses. It's a big book. It's it's a real big book. It's a real big book. It's it's many, many, many hundred pages. And it's a real difficult read in many ways. I was going to say its bigness is not just in how many pages it has, but it's kind of overflowing bigness. Yes. You know what I mean? It's got a very special kind of bigness. It's capacity, as well as the number of ways it sometimes seems to not want you to be able to read it very easily. Which of the books that we've read before does it remind you of most, like, in that respect? I keep thinking about Middlemarch, also maybe Dante. Yeah, I think those are pretty good things, although I don't think either of them really goes quite as no, deep no. as this does. You know, Ulysses is kind of its own thing. Mm. And it's also a big deal book. Like, let's just put this out there. This is often listed as, you know, one of the greatest novels of all time, or at least of the 20th century. It is considered a big landmark. Some people, I guess, argue it is the sort of foundation of Irish literature or modern Irish literature, the way that Dante's Commedia might be considered the foundational work of Italian literature. Though, of course, many people would take issue with that claim for Irish literature. And I can understand why. Uh, it's a big book. And it's a big book that a lot of people try to read and don't succeed in reading. This is the first time I've been able to read it cover to cover. Yeah, I know. The reading experience, is, uh, there's a lot to say about that. But, you know, just to pick up on what you were saying a moment ago, you know, it's seen as foundational in all different kinds of ways, not just with regard to sort of national literatures in a way that you could totally compare it to Dante's status within Italian literature, but also as like the great modernist novel, like as, as a novel that kind of set the course for what novel writing was going to look like in the 20th century. And that's interesting to think about in many ways. But one of the ways it's interesting to think about is how the work all also was intensely kind of polarizing and had all kinds of conflict around it because it was seen also as pornographic. So a book that was seen as transgressive was illegal in certain settings um, for a period of time, but at the same time has this super elevated status. So I think you kind of have to understand those two dimensions of the book as being in relationship to one another somehow. It's also a book whose status gets reflected in weird ways, right? Like it's celebrated by people who haven't necessarily read it. Yeah. A few years ago, I participated in a group reading of Ulysses. About 30 people got together to read an hour-long section each of it simultaneously. Oh, wow. So that anybody who came in could wander and hear the different voices going from, you know, reader to reader and so forth. And it was a tremendously fun thing to do. But it was also very strange because, of course, I had not read the entire book cover to cover, though I, you know, I knew a lot about it and I dipped my toes into it many times. I think a lot of people there hadn't read it cover to cover. There's no way to experience like understanding what the book is in that context. It's just sort of an object of veneration. And of course, it happened on June 16th on Bloomsday, the date that the book is set, uh, which has become a kind of holiday, not just for fans of Joyce or this book, but kind of people who are interested in modern or experimental literature or you know, just the novel or bookishness or anything can celebrate this. That's absolutely wild. I'm so enchanted by your description of the way in which this reading was not sequential, but simultaneous, where everybody was reading a different part all at once. You have a kind of cacophony, or you can make order of it by moving through the space. Because, you know, like you were saying, it's a kind of veneration that's brought to Ulysses in that kind of act. And it makes me think about reading practices that come out of sort of devotional circumstances in different religious um, or confessional traditions. And sometimes they involve reading a work from beginning to end, like, for example, how uh, the Torah might be read from beginning to end over a particular cycle, or different parts of the Christian Bible or the Quran might be read over particular cycles or any scripture. Or the Iliad. 
or the Iliad, right? Um, but I have ever heard of that practice of simultaneous reading um, in the in the Ethiopian um, Orthodox tradition of reading a sacred text where you have all the mourners who are gathered around the grave all reading different parts of the text. It's a devotional act. It doesn't matter that human beings can't really listen to all of it at once because, you know, it's heard in that sort of spiritual sense all at once. So it's really neat to think about Ulysses as inhabiting that weird kind of sacred secular space. That's so cool. I think that's also a good point for anybody who is listening to this who hasn't read Ulysses yet. Like, that's kind of how I read the book for decades. I, I first picked this book up. I first I first took Ulysses out of the library when I was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Was, that was not a time when I was going to actually make it through Ulysses. Uh, let's what say. what I don't brought think it, you to it, though? How did you come across it? Because it was the greatest book ever, oh, right? Like, it's yeah. the best novel ever. It's on the top of the list. I should check it out. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I enjoyed the fact that the very first page had a very, very large S on it. Mm -hmm. It was printed in that way where the very first word, stately, uh, just had a giant S that took up the entire first page. And I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I made it past page three before I was like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it's already thrown several different languages at me. I don't know who any of these people are. I don't understand why it's using M dashes instead of quotation marks. I had no bearing for this at all. Uh -huh. I picked it up again a few years later and got a little further into it. I spent a lot of my undergrad cutting classes and going to the library and reading Joyce Scholarship mm -hmm. and, you know, would come back and read here and there, read different sections of it with a general sense of what the book was more or less about, but not trying to do the marathon of, of, of reading the whole thing. And that was still kind of nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to do that if, if anything sounds appealing, but you don't want to try to commit to the challenge of reading the entire novel. Yeah, no, it's a strange, but I was thinking about that whole question of reading and reader's experience in the context of getting ready for today. And so I was sort of, you know, going through the book and kind of doing the things you do when you're sort of trying to master a text, like thinking about the shape and the chapters and the structure and all these kinds of things. But that was all like work, right? The only part of it that I got a huge amount of pleasure out of and always have with this book is just reading or better yet, even listening to it being read aloud and just where the, the words just sort of wash over you and you're, I don't know, it's like, it's very sensory, I guess, experience of the language. Like that's the thing that I like about this book. I find the kind of content of it. I'm like, it's a lot of work and it's kind of interesting and it's, mm. <laughs> but, but I really like in an unproblematic way, just the swashing of the words uh, over top. Yeah, no, I kind of agree. Although, you know, now that I've actually read the whole thing, I do like some of the larger scale aspects of the book a bit more. Um, but I also like never got as hooked into Ulysses because that was the thing that I enjoyed. I enjoyed the novel play with language and Joyce's tremendous ear for putting together wild sentences. And he does that even more so in his next novel, Finnegan's Wake, which is a very experimental thing where that dial of how far can we push language and what can we do to it and how can we have it be sensory first and sensical 19th, if at all, <laughs> is is such a better place to go. You can just read that and lose yourself in it. And it's even more rewarding because that's kind of mostly what it's trying to do. Or if it's trying to do more than that, it's so buried that really all you're going to get is that lovely floating sense of pure poetic language coming over you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some ways, it it, it it reminds me a little bit of our experience uh, reading and talking about some of Gertrude Stein's work, you know, especially where it was, I guess it was Tender Buttons, where we were talking about how it's, there, there's sense in it, but it's mostly about the sound of language and just the, whether it's the rhythms or the, the textures of language, that's what you're getting from it. I'm not saying they're the same, but the feeling I get from that reading is very similar. Yeah, absolutely. When did you read Ulysses first? It was actually, funnily enough, uh, I think I'd heard of it earlier, but I read it in college. I remember it was in my second year of college, and uh, so it was like uh, 81, 82. And um, Hugh Kenner, who was quite a famous scholar of Joyce, what would teach an undergraduate class in Ulysses, and it was just called Ulysses, right? And I might have signed up for it, but I dropped it pretty quickly because my schedule was too full. But I kept going because there were a whole bunch of auditors in that class, and he was absolutely hypnotic. And a bunch of us were like sitting on the floor, right? The room was packed. And what he would do, I remember absolutely nothing about anything he gave us like di in didactic terms or about like, again, structure or history or background or any of that stuff. He would just read. He would just choose out sections of the text and just read them to us in this way that made it really easy for you to get a sense of the text and the different levels and the different voices 
that were in the text. And that had a huge impact on me, uh, not just in terms of like, wow, Ulysses is really cool in that way. And obviously that uh, attentiveness to the oral, to sound and sensation of language. I mean, that's what sticks with me about the book. But it also taught me something super important that would inform all of my literature teaching after that was that if you could choose good passages to read aloud, you almost didn't have to explain like you'd have to explain very little if you chose your passages really well. Right. Um, so, so even so, my experience of reading Ulysses for the first time was like interesting in terms of the experience of Ulysses, but it was also kind of foundational to my whole sense of how you could mediate literature between a page and the people who are hearing it. Yeah, you know, and, and in fact, I think that is also something that can be said about Ulysses overall is that it is the kind of book that makes you, or makes a lot of people, anyways, reckon how they are going to engage with this book and then with books in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, this sort of transition from Ulysses to Finnegan's Wake in that period of my life was a moment of giving up in a very positive way, of letting go of the dream. Uh, you know, Ulysses st struck me as a book that one could try to master. Mm -hmm. There are so many details, so many little clues. It, it really rewards careful reading when you realize, oh, wait, that's a reference to this other thing that happened, you know, several hundred pages ago, but you need to really be paying attention to notice the connection. And so you could try to master it. And Finnegan's Wake... Forget it. No. It's, yeah. it's not written for that. Mm -mm. And if you can embrace that that if you can let go of your dreams of mastery, it opens up all sorts of new possibilities for how you deal with books and how you deal with texts. That's a really neat point, because I think you could say that, I mean, Ulysses is a number of things, but one of the things it is, is a book about books. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, um, Homer's Odyssey, but other things as well, right? But Finnegan's Wake, by contrast, is a book about language, right? So these are really two consecutive but totally distinct ways of thinking about how we connect to the world of writing. The other thing I was going to say, um, you were talking a little bit earlier about the extent to which Ulysses rewards the person who's willing to dig and figure out exactly what this reference or that reference might be pointing to or to unpack the intertextual connections or whatever. And I was really struck getting ready for today by the amount of scholarly apparatus out there to interpret the book. Like there's all kinds of commentaries. There's this one very magnificent Ulysses annotated it's called uh, Notes for James Joyce's Ulysses. And it's just basically this little encyclopedia, line by line, giving you a gloss for all the different references and its maps and diagrams and everything. And then uh, there's another one called The New Bloomsday Book that sort of basically translates it section by section. It basically tells you what's going on in case you don't know what's going on. You know, it's, it, it, but it's as if it was a translation. And I kept thinking about Dante, because it's not that I think that Joyce's Ulysses and Dante's Divine Comedy are very similar books in themselves. But I think the reading, and especially the reading apparatus that both that readers have brought and that the authors have invited, the reading apparatus that's brought to bear is just overwhelming. It's just like this huge cloud of stuff that's gathered around that pinpoint of the uh, the text. And I think that whole commentary tradition thing is super interesting. Like what is going on there when people try to control and embed a text in this spider web almost of everything it refers to? Yeah, I do want to say if listeners are looking for a guide to help them out, uh, they have lots of options. I found the annotated Ulysses to be overwhelming with detail. It's nice as a reference to look up when you really want to know about one specific thing. But certainly on your first time through, I would mostly not worry about that kind of detail. I found it much more helpful to have somebody who is helping summarize some of the more tricky chapters, like what is going on? Literally, where are we in this chapter? Because we've been jumping into people's streams of consciousness or jumping into parodies of writing styles or having hallucinatory sections at one point. And, you know, where are we? Can I, can I just make sure that I'm following the basic thread so that I can appreciate the illusions? Uh, there's a website called UlyssesGuide.com, which has also been turned into a book. I found that super helpful. I mean, it's not perfect, but I found it really helpful this time around. And this is the time that I actually made it through. So thumbs up <laughs> for that. Um, so yeah, so, so, so look for something like that, perhaps rather than uh, something that is really going to try to uh, annotate every last detail. But you know, then again, just do what you want. Like it's a book, <laughs> just have fun with it. So let's give a little bit of background for James Joyce. Uh, just so that everybody knows where he's coming from as a writer, I suppose. He was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1882 in a middle-class family. Um, he grows up as a, as a good student and eventually goes to University College Dublin and takes a real interest in literature, especially Henrik Ibsen, 
which is kind of interesting. I don't think we'll get to talk about that much, but, but I always find that kind of fascinating. Um, and he gets the, interested in particularly the idea of a very cosmopolitan Irish literature, you know, finding a lot of Irish literature to be very inward facing. He wants to think about it in a global sense. So, uh, I think Ulysses succeeds in doing both of those things. Um, he will meet his future wife, Nora Barnacle, in 1904. And in fact, the date that Ulysses takes place on, because like Mrs. Dalloway, it takes place on one day, is the date that he and Nora had their first proper date and their first proper sexual encounter. The two of them will, by the end of the year, move to continental Europe, where Joyce will teach English. He starts publishing then. He has a book of poems, Chamber Music, that comes out in 1907. And shortly after that, a well-regarded short story collection called Dubliners in 1914. And then a semi-autobiographical novel called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, uh, which centers around an author stand-in called Stephen Dedalus, who also appears in Ulysses, as actually do a few other smaller characters. Ulysses, in fact, starts out as a short story for Dubliners, but it takes on a life of its own, and he spends several years fleshing it out, expanding it. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. He starts publishing it serially in 1918, and then finally it comes out as a book in 1922, so 100 years ago this year. And it causes a huge scandal even before the book is fully published. One of the early versions of a chapter gets in the wrong hands, you could say, and leads to a ban on the book's publication in the United States, which is upheld until 1934. Yay. Um, and then after Ulysses is published, Joyce starts writing Finnegan's Wake, as we said. That's published in 1939, and he dies two years later from complications from surgery just before his 59th birthday. One of the things I find really interesting about him, too, is he spent much of his adult life in Paris, right, living in a kind of exile or self-imposed exile, I guess you could say, which was not totally unconnected to the scandal around Ulysses, right? So um, it's interesting to think about that that way of being, you know, writing in English, Irish English, right? Writing in a land where people are not speaking the same language. Gertrude Stein reflects on that experience of being someone um, who's writing in English, but being in another country. And that's kind of interesting to think about. And that circumstance of exile, even self-imposed exile is a neat contrast with Dante as well. Yeah, you'll remember that Joyce and his family make an appearance in a movable feast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, and Paris is where he finishes writing Ulysses. So let's talk about that. The plot. Yes, the plot. The tremendous amount of plot in Ulysses. <laughs> sort of. Although also kind of nothing happens, but it's complicated. Yeah, I, I think you'd say one at the same time, nothing happens and a lot of stuff happens. And that in itself is kind of remarkable. Exactly. So as I said, like Mrs. Dalloway, Ulysses follows some people as they travel around a city doing this and that over the course of a single day. This time, the city is Dublin and the date is June 16th, 1904. And our main characters are Stephen Dedalus, who is the lead character of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Leopold Bloom, and Molly Bloom. Stephen is a 22-year-old frustrated writer who's kind of stuck waiting for his life to begin. Leopold and Molly are in their 30s. They have a daughter, Millie, who just turned 15. And their marriage is going through a tricky patch. He is going to spend his long day wandering throughout the streets of Dublin, thinking about how Molly is at home hooking up with another man. And a lot of things happen over the course of that day. Uh, but instead of trying to sort of info dump them all right now, I, I think we should talk about each of the characters in turn and just sort of what they're like and what the text around them is like. And I figured we should start with Stephen. Yeah, because the narrative starts with him, right? You know, we didn't talk particularly about the sort of structure of the work, but one of the interesting, there's a number of different ways to kind of cut it up, but one of the ways you can cut it up is into three parts. The first three cha uh, three chapters or episodes of the book, and then the last three, which are sort of, each of which are doing kind of their own thing, and then this big in-between section. And I don't think it's completely coincidental that there's also three main characters. Um, not that I would line each one of them up perfectly with each of those sections, but I feel like there's a real symmetry there. There is, and it's been noted that the first section, which is largely from Stephen's point of view, begins with the word stately and a giant letter S in that edition that I brought from the library as a kid. That's the one I had first too. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's S, uh, Stephen thinking of himself. The second part, which is mostly but not entirely from Leopold Poldy Bloom, starts with Mr., which is him, M, which is him thinking about Molly. And then the third section, which includes a chapter that is entirely from Molly's point of view, uh, but also takes place back at the house where she's been most of the day, uh, starts with a P, which is for Poldy. 
uh, Leopold's nickname, what, what, what Molly calls him. So they are sort of sectioned up into these different characters, and it's about who these characters are thinking about, or at least so the argument has been made, and I for one believe it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a neat kind of structure that is there, but it kind of, it's very flexible, right? It's very supple. Exactly. So yeah, the first three chapters show us Stephen's mourning. Um, how would you describe Stephen as a character? He's really whiny. He's insufferable. <laughs> I mean, he's unhappy. And, you know, in some ways that's for good reasons. His mother has died not too long before, and that's caused him a lot of emotional hardship. And some of his friends are real assholes. Like, so, you know, one has some sympathy, but he's also extremely self-involved. He's above it all. He thinks he's above it all. Oh, yeah. In a way that completely alienates him from everyone else. And also his mind, because, of course, we're spending quite a lot of time in this book doing stream of consciousness style writing, spending a lot of time sort of in the interiority of these characters. His interior monologue is full of pointless illusions. Yeah. I was thinking about this, you know, of those first three episodes or chapters. I keep going between calling the episodes and chapters because Joyce doesn't really write them as chapters in the usual kind of very shaped chapter way, I guess I would say. Um, they're, they're more like, first we're here, and then we're here, and then we're here. You know, and we could say maybe more about the different flavor of the different chapters. But the third of them, Proteus, really captures what you were just describing about the contents of Stephen Dedalus's head. You know, it's just full of all this, not just stream of consciousness stuff, but, you know, reference to this and that and, you know, all this weird intertextual stuff, all these different languages, all these different bits and pieces of thought. And in some ways, it's kind of frustrating. It's a bit like running up against a wall in some ways. It's almost impenetrable in some ways. But it is maybe an effective reflection of like, what is the inside of people's, like, our minds are messy on the inside, right? When we're not engaged in giving shape to what we think through speech or through writing or something like that, right? I mean, is just all this stuff swashing around. And that's what's swashing around inside of Stephen. Yes. Uh, let's see if we can find an example of that. He is looking out at the water and he says, in long lassoes from the cock lake, the water flowed full, covering green goldenly lagoons of sand, rising, flowing. My ash plant will float away. I shall wait. No, they will pass on, passing, chafing against the low rocks, swirling, passing. Better get this job over quick. Listen, a four-worded wave speech. Sisu. Vehement breath of waters amid sea snakes, rearing horses, rocks, etc. I mean, it's a lovely passage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is he talking about? I mean, he's noticing the sounds that the water is making. He's thinking about his ash plant walking cane. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. But that's the thing, right? It's, I mean, you can go to one of these, you know, like the Ulysses annotated, right? And, and unpack it and figure out exactly what the references are. But, but that's not the point here. The point is that's what the inside of the person's mind is like. And the passage is sometimes incredibly beautiful. I, I found one that I was really struck by too, that I really, I don't know, that was lovely, but absolutely impenetrable. Um, reading two pages a piece of seven books every night, eh? I was young. You bowed to yourself in the mirror, stepping forward to applause earnestly, striking face. Hooray for the goddamned idiot. Hooray. No one saw. Tell no one. Books you were going to write with letters for titles. Have you read his F? Oh, yes, but I prefer Q. Yes, but W is wonderful. Oh, yes, W. Remember your epiphanies on green oval leaves, deeply deep copies to be sent if you died to all the great libraries of the world, including Alexandria? It goes on and it's like, it's beautiful, but you're like oriented and disoriented and oriented and disoriented as you go through. That that was one of my favorite passages. When I, I was knew you would like that one. <laughs> that was, I mean, that's early enough in the book that I actually read it. And, it. and as, you know, the frustrated writer person I was at the time, the idea of the writing the books and all of them having a single letter name just seemed amazing. <laughs> w was wonderful. Oh, yes, W. <laughs> When I was young and stupid, I sympathized a lot more with Stephen than I do now. I do find him much more irritating than I did the first time I read this. Oh, boy. All right. Well, let's move on from Stephen okay. and his and his poor situation. He's got some bad friends for roommates, and he's going to have a big fight with them, and we'll catch up with him in a bit. Um, in part two, we are introduced in particular to Leopold Bloom. Bloom, as he's known throughout the book, uh, who's making breakfast in one of the most charming sections with a really cute interaction with a cat that I just mm -hmm. still absolutely love. And I want to, I guess I want to highlight the cat bit for a second. 
The cat bit is awesome. What I love about it is that, so he's making food. He's making breakfast. The cat wants its milk for the morning. And the cat will cry out three times for milk. The cat walks stiffly around a leg of the table with the tail on high. Meow! <laughs> oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. He says, milk for the pussins, as he bends down to, to give her a little pet. And she says, meow! <laughs> And then uh, he talks to her a bit more. And then finally she says, mur, mur, meow. and the thing is, like, <laughs> these three meows are spelled differently. Yeah. And they're yeah. more complicated as it goes along. Because the cat is more annoyed. Yeah. And it just shows the <laughs> level of detail that Joyce is going to give to the way that languages can be tweaked to be both expressive mm. and yet novel and baffling. Right? Mm-hmm, this, mm-hmm. This, this spelling of a meow... M-R-K-R-G-N-A-O has never happened before. No one has ever spelled the meow like that. And yet, here it is. It's in a context where it makes sense. And you can you can hear the cat getting more impatient with each passing meow. <laughs> it's so good. I agree with you completely. One of the things he does, too, is when he's doing these really innovative things with language is he embeds it uh, at times within passages that are still, I don't know, challenging a little bit, but are familiar in the mode in which they're written. In other words, they're quite lovely I don't know. It's a little bit like, you know, if you see somebody who's doing, an artist who does abstract art, right, of some sort, and then somebody who's not very familiar with what's going on there will be like, oh, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, they're just, they can't draw or paint things the way they really are. But then you'll see a combination of really skillful rendition you know, in a in a kind of literal way, combined with abstraction, you realize these people are actually, you know, it's not that they don't have the tools, it's that they're using different kinds of tools. Joyce is doing something a little bit like that, because you get a passage like the one you were just reading, where the cat has just said for the third time, Row. and then it says this, she blinked up out of her avid shame, closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went to the dresser, took the jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer, and set it slowly on the floor. I mean, that's that's quite lovely, but um, it's familiar. You know what I mean? It's a kind of lovely writing that you could find in, in other writers of the period, but it's juxtaposed with this really transgressive way of managing language. Yeah, this is sort of, I, I often think about this, and I, and I probably should write something up at some point, but this is kind of like a tutorial level in a video game. Mm, mm-hmm. This chapter is teaching you some of the ways that the book is going to work and the way it's going to treat language is going to work. You've, you've learned this from the three chapters with Stephen a bit, which each got more and more complicated into his head, but we're sort of starting fresh here. And yeah, we're, we're getting in very immediately, this is very early on in that chapter, but oh, we're getting a sense of how language is going to be played with and in what context and and sort of how you should read it, which I think is really interesting. Um, We're also getting an introduction to Leopold himself. And I think one of his defining character attributes is that he is very curious about the world. He's sort of an armchair, self-taught, wannabe intellectual, or not intellectual, but somebody who, you know, picks up popular science books and tries to understand how the world works and half remembers explanations or puts together theories that may or may not be true about everything. You know, he sees something and he tries to, he tries to say, Oh, wait, how does that work again? Oh, yeah, no, it's something, it's, it has something to do with levers. And this is one of the most charming things about him in many ways, this sort of intense curiosity, very friendly curiosity most of the time about everything. Yeah. He's very approachable, you know. He's someone who kind of connects with others in many, many different kinds of ways. And in that respect, he's very, I think, quite different from Stephen Dedalus. And this happens in casual ways when we see Bloom interacting with people in different kinds of ways in shops and other kinds of settings, but also in all the tangled web of relationships he's in. Like, we'll talk in a moment about his relationship with his wife, Molly, and the relationship that she has and how he's aware of them and in a sense is almost connected to them. But he also, we find out um, early in the second section, he's got um, a correspondence that reveals another set of relationships that he has. Yes, he does. He is engaged in a bit of a postcard affair, basically, uh, with another woman, uh, presumably. Martha. Martha. He's got a pen name, Henry Flower. Flower and Bloom, get it? Um, but yes, his curiosity is interesting. You know, Molly is a singer and she's been working on this Italian song and there's a word in it, Volio, V-O-G-L-I-O, which has that weird G-L-I sound and Bloom isn't quite sure and Molly isn't quite sure how it should be pronounced. And Bloom is going to think about this all day. 
He's going to think again and again and again, how would this word be pronounced until like 700 pages later, he's finally going to try to ask Stephen this question because Stephen does speak <laughs> Italian. And of course, volio means I want, right? Mm-hmm. Which is what's entirely at stake in terms of the relationship between Molly and Bloom and, you know, Bloom thinking about, well, what does Molly want? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a very Dante thing too, huh? I mean, I don't want to push that too hard, but like, I'm wondering if, I mean, certainly Stephen Dedalus would, be, would would notice that. Yeah. The other thing I, I guess we should say uh, about uh, Leopold is that he's very earthy and bodily at times. Bodily, yeah, yeah. And specifically that first chapter ends with him going back to the outhouse and defecating and tearing pages out of a literary journal to use as toilet paper. Yeah, no, it's it it ends in that way as you said, and it begins also with eating, right? Like, I mean, it's almost like in that um in that um chapter, uh, chapter four, Calypso, um, it begins with him eating, right? Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls and so on, um, but then it ends, you know, at the other end, as it were, right? So it's almost like you move through the digestive tract in the chapter. Yeah, um, anything that a person can get out of their body. He's gotten out of their body at some point in this novel. Mm, uh, people mm. defecate, people urinate, people fart, people uh, ejaculate, uh, people uh, begin menstruating or you know begin their cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, it all it all happens. Uh, this book is very interested in that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And like you said, Bloom is the character it gets associated with more, or I don't know, most of all, but definitely more than Stephen. Bloom engages with it far more deeply. Stephen is not interested in this at all. He, he doesn't seem to be thinking about it too much. Mm-hmm. Bloom is very aware of it and very self-conscious about it. And Molly, I mean, we'll get to her, but Molly treats it like stuff, right? Like, it's it's no big deal. It doesn't seem to be quite as caught up in her psychosexual formation as it is for Bloom. Yeah. We were talking earlier about the ways in which the three big parts of the book kind of, in in a sense, correspond to the the three main characters. We've talked about Stephen, and we've talked about Leopold Bloom a bit. How do you see Molly fitting into that? Because I found myself, this this time reading um, the book, I found the the way gender was functioning in this book, especially the ways in which women are seen, whether it's as daughters or mothers or sexual partners or wives. I found it kind of weird and off-putting, maybe especially coming off the heels of reading Mrs. Dalloway. Like I'd been thinking about gender and women also in other kinds of ways. And I found that here, I found myself stumbling over stuff in here and being like, wow, that's icky. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to downplay any ickiness of it, but it's definitely like so much in the book. It's really complicated. You know, all the characters tend to be richly drawn. They, they, they contain multitudes. They think two contradictory things at the same time, all the time. Molly gets the very final chapter. It is entirely told from her perspective. Famously, it is told in eight sentences with no punctuation, just paragraph breaks. And it is beautifully flowing prose as her thoughts wend and wind from this to that to the other thing, thinking over, well, all sorts of things, her life, her day, what she's been up to, particularly focusing on her sexual history, because that's been a big part of today as, you know, she had sex with a new lover today and had mixed feelings about it. Yeah, what do you make of that fact that Molly's stream of consciousness, like the 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 nature of the prose in that closing chapter, you know, we get stream of consciousness both from Stephen and from Leopold Bloom, right? But it's it's a bit different in that last chapter. What do you make of that difference of form? Like with Stephen, for example, we talked about all that like wild intertextuality in the third chapter, Proteus, right? Where where it, it's it's choppy in all different kinds of ways, and he's clearly having this thought and that thought, and this thought takes him to that Greek quotation or whatever, right? And then we could also describe the ways in which stream of consciousness works for Leopold Bloom. It's like bodily impulses are constantly intruding and taking him in different kinds of directions, right? Yeah, and, and curiosity about the world. I mean, yeah, Leopold's sentences often end before they're over because some other thought has come to mind. It's very uh, scattershot in an interesting way. Um, And so in a certain sense, it's interesting that Molly's interior monologue, in some ways I find, makes more sense than Stephen's or Leopold's. She is thinking more in sentences, but the sentences are all bleeding into each other, so to speak. And yet it's still 
most of the time, I guess you can sort of figure out where the sentence breaks would be if there were punctuation in it. It's not, it's, it, it's, it's, it's well written in that sense. Uh, it is not as confusing as Stephen or Leopold at their most confusing. Yeah. It's almost like there's not a lot of intrusions, right? It's just this sort of well of subjectivity, right? Which is a bit different from the kind of, I don't know, troubled waters, right? Of Stephen's mind. And then the cross currents, right? If to use the metaphor of, uh, of Leopold Bloom's mind. And in some ways, like that's really neat and admirable. It makes for beautiful prose. If like I have, I'm of two minds about it. Like one thing I, I sometimes think is like, wow, is this just a way of kind of representing women's subjectivity as kind of inchoate and irrational and sort of, you know, like that, right? That That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is like when, when you're depicting subjectivity in a sort of abstracted form, there's a tendency, or at least some writers do this, to, to associate it with a female character. And here I'm thinking of Chaucer's Crusade and Troilus and Crusade. I'm thinking of Isabel Archer in um, Henry James's Portrait of a Lady, you know, where you want to depict interiority and, and subjectivity. That's how you do it. Um, you know, so I, so on the one hand, it's kind of very positive, almost putting up on a pedestal, kind of. And on the other hand, I see it as a little bit, I don't know, not cliched exactly, but, you know, saying something very different about women's consciousness from what, let's say, Wolf would say. Right. And it's been read differently over the years since the novel came out. There have been all sorts of trends, both of reading it and very feminist and very anti-feminist lights. Mm -hmm. You know, it's seen as a sort of form of écriture féminine. And, you know, I, I get that, I guess. Mm. I, I totally see where you're coming from. And I don't want to dismiss it while I do want to complicate it, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think th I think that there's a long history of reading Molly Bloom's monologue as being a stand-in for the woman. And I'm not 100% sure whether that's what Joyce is doing or not, right? Like, Molly's a character in this, and she was read as standing in for the woman. And there's a long critical tradition of this. But is that something that Joyce is putting on, out there, or is it something that critical readers are imposing upon the text? Because again, you were saying you know, things like, oh, you know, not logical. But in some ways, her thinking is more logical than the other two characters, which one of which is just full of illusions, <laughs> and one of which is logical statements that don't finish, that don't go anywhere. The path of her waters, so to speak, is circular, right? She, she keeps looping back to the ideas that she started with. She'll go off, wander around for a while, come back, and then it'll connect up. Sort of like uh, how we describe some of Lee Maracle's writing, actually, now that I think mm. about it. Um, it just, you know, it comes back. Like, the story is, is told in circles. Yeah, maybe. The one thing I was struck by actually reading this time is, you know, there's that chapter, um, Nausicaa, uh, it's chapter 13, where Bloom is at the strand, at the beach, at the at the edge of the river, and he sees um, some girls there. And one of the girls is named Gertie. And I was struck how some of the passages that give us her interiority, uh, it, it seemed to echo or there was a resonance, I thought, with some of the ways that Molly's interior voice is described. So I'm just going to give a little tiny example. Um, She's she's looking out over the water, and while she gazed, her heart went pit a pat. Yes, it was her he was looking at, and there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her as though they would search her through and through, read her very soul. Wonderful eyes they were, superbly expressive, but could you trust them? People were so queer. She could see at once by his dark eyes and his pale intellectual face that he was a foreigner. The image of the photo she had of Martin Harvey, the matinee idol, only for the mustache, which she preferred because she wasn't stage-struck like Winnie Rippingham that wanted they two to always dress the same on account of a play, but she could not see whether he had an aquiline nose or slightly retroussé from where he was sitting. And it goes on. So it's not quite the same, but this, I don't know, liquid quality to thought, where it's not very structured. It, it seemed it, it echoed for me a little bit some of what we find in that last chapter. Yeah, and uh, you're right. And also, it's tricky because mm -hmm. uh, this is a chapter that's written through the lens of romance novels, like the kind that his wife reads, and which turns out he also reads. Um, and so, it, like many of the chapters, like most of the chapters have some sort of literary shtick going on. Uh, and so, they're taking on some voice or, or modeling themselves on some kind of other writing. And so, yeah, the, this is doing part of that. Now, maybe that's an indication that all of Molly's speech is also coming from something that's informed by how, you know, traditions of how women are represented in those books. 
And it might be. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's a feminine subjectivity constructed not by a woman writer. Well, exactly. Or, you know, I mean, I don't know. So it's, so it's complicated, right? And so that's one of the reasons why it's so interesting. And this is the first time I've ever done it, reading this book, reading Joyce's Ulysses up against having just read um, one of Wolf's novels, right? Because they're obviously very, very different kinds of writers, but they're writing roughly in the same period, right? Their writing uh, period overlaps, right? And um, both known for the modernist novel, right? Really important figures in the development of the modernist novel. Um, not, not the modern novel, right? But modernism, right? That, that literary movement. And yet could not be more different, I think, in some really profound ways. Oh, absolutely. And we don't get the interiority of a female character like Mrs. Dalloway, you no. know, like Clarissa Dalloway. We don't get somebody who is as... It was a complicated mind. Well, yeah, I don't want to quite necessarily go there. I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to like, Molly's mind is complicated. It's just complicated in different ways. But who is as self-assured and polished, in a sense, as Clarissa is? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it is a, it is a good question. Um, so, famously, Wolf didn't think much of Joyce's Ulysses. Um, do we know what Joyce thought of Wolf's writing? Ooh, that's a great question, and I have no idea. Mm, well, I wonder if he ever said anything about it or not. That in itself is a way to say something. That is. <laughs> we haven't talked about the city, who's the other great character in this uh, in this novel. Yeah, this book put Dublin on the map. That's not true. But, <laughs> um, you know, Dublin plays a big character here, and, and Joyce went through tremendous amounts of effort and research to ensure that his representation of Dublin 1904 would be as historically accurate as possible. Mm. And geographically, like you you can map out, and people have mapped out exactly where we are in each episode. Exactly. And several of the locations that are mentioned, I mean, they're all more or less real locations, some of which still exist and some of which have taken on, you know, lives of their own connected to the novel. The uh, There's a pharmacy where Leopold Bloom buys a bar of lemon-scented soap uh, and puts in an order for uh, a, a an ointment for his wife, which he never picks up. Um, that pharmacy still exists. It still existed as a pharmacy until somewhere around, I think, 2009, at which point the business had to close. And it was uh, taken over by a Joyce Appreciation Society, basically. And it spent many years as a meeting place for readings of Ulysses and where you could buy copies of Ulysses and bars of lemon soap. My trip to Dublin, I failed to remember this place and I didn't go to it, which, Aww. oh, well. <laughs> but it's interesting that it left its mark there. And and it's interesting to think about the ways that um, the city plays out in the novel. And again, he's writing about that city when he's not present in that city, right? I mean, he's already living abroad. Yeah, exactly. Um, what do you think he thinks of Dublin? Well, that is a complicated question. I mean, I keep thinking, I mean, I keep talking about Dante. Yeah, I keep thinking of Dante's Florence, right? It's not not quite like that, but it's a little bit like that in the sense, like, there's a lot of emotions around the city and, and the cityscape itself. You know, one of the chapters, which is not in itself a particularly interesting chapter, like it's it's a bit too sort of broken up and episodic, um, chapter 10, Wandering Rocks, uh, we follow different people for a little bit through a kind of itinerary in the city. And so like the the concept of the chapter is I think quite interesting. But one of the things I was struck by looking at that chapter for today, you know, sometimes you're in a city and you come to a particular location that is very has a very layered history, has a very deep history under it, right? Like this is here now, but this was there before and then before that was this other thing. And so on, you know, this idea of like places that are heavy with urban memory kind of, right? And so there's some moments like that in the chapter. And there was a couple of them that really struck me. One of them is where we're with a, a person called Ned Lambert. And he's in a church. And um, someone there says, how interesting. And um, he replies, yes, sir, Ned Lambert said heartily. We're standing in the historic council chamber of St. Mary's Abbey, where Silken Thomas proclaimed himself a rebel in 1534. This is the most historic spot in all Dublin. O'Madden Burke is going to write something about it one of these days. The old Bank of Ireland was over the way, until the time of the Union, and the original Jews' temple was here too, before they built their synagogue over in Adelaide Road. You were never here before, Jack, were you? No, Ned. And that passage is interesting in, like, at least two ways. One is, again, that kind of, like, historical depth, these like locations that anchor the city in time. But also it's one of many, many passages, including a couple of others in the same chapter, that talk about the Jews, 
Right. Right. And, and I say the Jews advisedly because it's always that kind of thing. I think the first time that happens is in the second chapter, Nestor, where Stephen is at the school where he teaches and the person who, for sort of his boss, um, says something particularly grossly. It's a beautiful passage, but it's grossly anti-Semitic. Yeah. But the prose is beautiful, right? Um, and here in this chapter, in chapter 10, Wandering Rocks, um, we have not just the passage I read a few moments ago, but also one of the characters says, I'm going to show you a little trick. I'll leave you all where Jesus left the Jews. Look, there's all I have. I got two shillings from Jack Power, and I spent tuppence for a shave for the funeral. So, like, there's these, like, little casual, I mean, I don't know if anti-Semitic is the right word, these, like, casual ways of anchoring what's happening in the narrative and where we are in the city in terms of Jewish identity and Jewish history. And that's interesting. And the fact that the character of Leopold Bloom is at least of Jewish heritage, it's not quite clear where he sits, I think, in that world, is part of what's going on. I guess what I mean is that it reads really differently from how it would read if none of the men of the main characters had that kind of connection. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is one of the central issues of the book, right, is that Leopold is Jewish, or at least was Jewish, was raised Jewish. His father was Jewish, born in Hungary, moved to Ireland, married an Irish woman, and had Leopold, who converted to Protestantism and then converted again to Catholicism in order to marry Molly. Molly herself was born in Gibraltar to an Irish soldier father and a Spanish mother, a Spanish Jewish mother. So both of them carry some of this marker of Jewishness. Um, Leopold seems more fraught about it, uh, but everybody understands Leopold through the lens of his Jewishness. This comes up again and again, and it doesn't seem like this comes up at all for Molly, which is interesting. Uh, most notably, it comes up for Leopold during one of the chapters, which uh, culminates in uh, an attempted assault on Bloom for being Jewish by somebody who is known as the citizen, which is this very parodic form of a nationalist, somebody who is very much interested in Ireland as an Irish Catholic space, etc., and who just gets more and more enraged and drunk as the chapter goes on. It's a fascinating chapter. I actually really enjoyed it on this read through, which I uh, did not expect to. It's one of the most. It's it's a very striking chapter in how direct it is in talking about the issues of who belongs to the city, of who belongs in this place. Exactly, exactly. And as we're talking about these passages, I mean, it becomes clearer to me than maybe it was earlier, is that this is about showing us what the city is like in that respect. What is the environment that these main characters, and Bloom in particular, live within? Yeah. Right? And and, and this casual anti-Semitism and this weird sense of where Jewish history fits within urban history and urban spaces, That's that's a big part of his experience and our sense of the city. Yeah. It's also a very sort of closed-minded city or, or non-cosmopolitan city in many ways. It's a place where someone like Leopold, who is kind of interested in things in the world and has, you know, vaguely intelligent observations to make and wants to get at things, like, that is not okay. He is also completely made fun of for not participating in the culture of drinking that's going all around and in constantly bringing up these little scientific intellectual questions, which all of his friends just make fun of him for. He, he's a very lonely person uh, to the point that, you know, this sort of leads to, in many ways, the culmination of the plot, which is when he meets Stephen, who he didn't really know. It's sort of the son of one of his friends. Um, he meets up with Stephen, starts following him in this sort of very nice paternal way as Stephen gets drunker and drunker over the course of the book and gets in fights with his friends and heads into the, the red light district of Dublin. Bloom follows him carefully, tries to extricate him when things get a bit nasty there, and then comes up with this idea that actually maybe this intelligent boy who is, you know, mm -hmm. I guess not that bad looking, might be a better lover for <laughs> his wife and then might also be a good friend to him. And he doesn't have a place to live. He could stay with us and maybe we could work something out. And we've already learned in, through some of the hallucinatory psychosexual explorations that go on in the chapter that takes place in the Red Light District that, like, Bloom has some wild ideas about sex. He's very kinky. And his sense of, like, what it means for his wife to be sleeping with other men is not cut and dry. <laughs> he mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of enjoys it, but kind of doesn't like the particular guy that she's, you know, hooking up with today and wants to find a more amenable solution for everyone involved. 
Mm-hmm. It's a fascinating moment, but you also get the sense that like this is not a thing that can fly in Dublin in 1904. No. He's immediately thinking about what everybody else is going to say about it. There's this weird doubleness in what's going on, right? Like on the one hand, again, remember that like Ulysses is taking place sort of as a, as a mirror in a way of the Odyssey, right? And so these main characters of the Odyssey, so Telemachus and Odysseus and Penelope, right? That that three-part family dynamic in this book, in Joyce's Ulysses, is replaced by um, Stephen Dedalus as a kind of, you know, young man, right? Um, and Leopold Bloom as the Odysseus figure, and Molly as kind of the Penelope figure. I mean, that's what that closing monologue chapter is called, Penelope, right? And so, on the one hand, you can read what's happening with them as like, Stephen is almost like a kind of a surrogate son taking the place of the child that um, Bloom and Molly had lost years ago. And, you know, so that's sort of there for you as a safe reading, but this other reading that you were describing is absolutely there, right? So it's almost there's a narrative and a counter narrative, like what what the relationship is between the older man and the younger man. Like that that relationship is super important, and it's being kind of set up against the father and son relationship, both with reference to Homer's Odyssey, but also in the kind of Catholic you know, the doxology, right? And the whole question of what's the relationship of the father and the son and that whole thing, right? That's that's there too, I think. Yeah, and and possibly also sort of some Greek models of of interrelations between younger men and older men. For sure, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, these are all on the table, and Bloom is open to all of it, um, which is, I mean, he has complicated feelings about it. Like he's 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 a kinky guy who has not yet come to terms with that entirely, so to speak. But like he's interested in all that. Molly is also not entirely disinterested in that. But he will propose this to Stephen slowly over the course of the day, and Stephen will basically shut him down. <laughs> Stephen's involvement in the book ends with him stepping out of the Blooms' home and just wandering off. We don't know where he spends the night. We don't know what happens next. We don't know anything that goes on with Stephen. We also don't really know what goes on with Molly and Leopold's relationship. Over the course of her closing monologue, she first starts by sort of glorying and reveling in Blazes Boylan, the guy she hooked up with today, who, although he is a bit brash and rude and slaps her a bit too much for her taste, is, you know, uh, well hung in a good lay. Um, mm-hmm. Then she thinks about all the other people she's had in her life, uh, think, and makes fun of Bloom at the beginning, remembers that he was bringing up Stephen a lot, and suddenly realizes what he's doing, and is like, oh, well, you know, maybe this nice little poet boy, that could be fun before finally ending with a remembrance of the day Bloom proposed to her and the way that she assented to that. Yes, I will. Yes, I said yes. And that's where the book ends. But whether we're supposed to understand that as like, oh, you know, Leopold and Molly are going to get back together again. This is great. Or whether it's something more complicated, like the, the, the text doesn't want to tell us. The text is not going to give us an easy answer to that, nor I think should it. Yeah, well, I I agree with you. Like, those last few pages are extraordinarily beautiful. I mean, not just that last little paragraph, but those last few pages are extraordinarily beautiful. And what they're giving us is, like, her remembering a past experience where that boundary between one person and the other, like, between subject and object, right, is kind of all blurred, right? I'm just going to read a couple lines of it. And all the queer little gardens and pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl where I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used. Or shall I wear a red? Yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I? Yes, to say yes. My mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Right? It's it's his thought. It's her thought. It's, you know, like these are two bodies, but they're kind of one. And that's just the memory. We don't know where they're going to be in the present moment of, you know, June 16th, right? But but um, in memory, they're, they're kind of one thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, such a beautiful ending. Um, it is. Before we wrap up, I mean, we could talk so much more. And oh, there's yeah. so much detail we haven't gone into. Um, but before we wrap up, I just want to know, like, your favorite parts of the book. Oh, that's hard. 
because it's they're so scattered and in, 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 in all over the place. Like they're, they're some of these. I think I read some of my favorite passages. Some of the ones that I just find extremely beautiful, and they're maybe not the most transgressive or creative parts of um, Joyce's prose, but I just find them compellingly beautiful. The the, the last few pages of of the book are just overwhelmingly beautiful. Yeah. Um, how about you? What are the parts that stick with you most, or that you love the most? In addition to loving. The last, I mean, the last few pages, as you say, are completely gorgeous. Um, and I like the last section in general. I also really love the next to last section, which is this very unusual bit told in this kind of question and answer format. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> it's it's so much fun. It, it's it's such an interesting sort of kind of impersonal way to describe the climax of Bloom and Stevens' moments together. It's almost like a catechism or something. Yeah, but it's impersonal, right? Mm-hmm, yeah, like mm-hmm. the moment when, in many ways, you you most want emotional closure between the sort of will they or won't they that's been going <laughs> that's been building between Stephen and Leopold. It just backs away. Joyce isn't going to give it to you directly. And so instead you get this thing where it's like an interrogation or a catechism or or a philosophical treatise or something where there's just a question that gets answered in this very interestingly flat voice. Let me find a good example of it. Um, How did Bloom prepare a collation for a Gentile? He poured into two teacups, two level spoonfuls, four in all, of Epps soluble cocoa, and proceeded according to the directions for use printed on the label, to each adding, after sufficient time for infusion, the prescribed ingredients for diffusion in the manner and in the quantity prescribed. What supererogatory marks of special hospitality did the host show his guest? Relinquishing his symposiarchal right to the mustache cup of imitation (laughs) crown derby presented to him by his only daughter, Millicent, Millie, He substituted a cup identical with that of his guest and served extraordinarily to his guest and, in reduced measure, to himself, the viscous cream ordinarily reserved for the breakfast of his wife, Marion. Molly. (laughs) Like. What is that? (laughs) I love that. I would read a whole book written like that. (laughs) I love this weird voice coming in and just like breaking everything down and, and saying it in the most silly over-determined way possible. I think I read somewhere that Joyce said that was his favorite section. He did, yeah. And he's right. <laughs> <laughs> that section, I mean, a lot of people talk about the humor of the book, and a lot of that humor I find fairly inaccessible. Like, I can read why people think a section is funny, and I can go, yeah, all right. Um, that chapter, in terms of the literary style at least, that chapter is actually, I think, very amusing and delightful, while also being weirdly emotional. By approaching the text in these unexpected directions, it can allow a different outflow of emotion, which I, I find remarkable. Yeah. In short, do you recommend our listeners read Ulysses? I think it's a book that... Um, it's really easy to bounce off of, and the way to approach it is just to dip into it, find parts, enjoy the language, and if you want to go deeper, then find some of the scaffolding that we've suggested and let that help you orient yourself. Um, like It shouldn't be burdensome, uh, but it is really captivating. Yeah. I, I think if listeners have been interested in reading Ulysses, they should, and they should, again, as you say, don't make it a burden. But if it's always seemed like it would be a big bother and not the kind of thing you're interested in. That's fine. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. And, and if you're dipping in, I think the first two chapters, I think, and the last one are probably the easiest ones to enter into. Honestly, if you're just dipping into it, I would start with chapter four when we introduce Bloom. Yeah, actually, you're right. That's a good place to start. <laughs> Skip, Stephen. You don't need that. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the cat, right? The cat's there. So yeah, enjoy you that. You want the cat. You want the kidneys. You want the pooping. You want all 100%. that stuff. Yeah. You're right. Four is the place to start. Uh, and then skip ahead and poke about the last two chapters. And I, I think you're pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in between as well. Oh, there's all kinds of cool stuff. And there's a lot of really, really hard to read chapters and a lot of... Uh, upsetting and problematic content. And each one is a different flavor. Like Sirens is kind of about sound, right? I mean, they're all doing totally different kinds of things. There's one that's in the form of a play. They're all doing totally different things. There's a, there's a chapter which sort of tries to replicate the evolution of English language prose styling, starting with yeah. sort of an Anglo-Saxon alliteration thing and moving all the way on to like future slang. Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> it's the worst chapter in the book. It's not fun at all. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
there's so much more we could talk about, but we have to leave Ulysses behind for other shores. Yes, indeed. What are we going to read next time? We're going to read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I'm really looking forward to that. I read that years ago, and I've been looking forward to rereading it for some time now. It's been a book on my to-read list for a long time, and I'm very glad to finally get to it. I think you'll like it. Yeah. Well, until then, listener, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 57, and The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, see you again at The Spouter Inn.